This podcast recounts true crime events that contain adult themes. The content may be graphic or explicit, and as such, may not be everyone's cup of tea. Viewer discretion is advised. Also, spoiler alert. A man's voice is heard introducing an individual of great stature, commenting, quote, I'm very honored to introduce our guest lecturer today. He graduated from here about 15 years ago. He's gone on to have a fabulous career, and I can't think of a single person who's more qualified or more adept at the final procedures you've been studying lately. As he continues, a biblical scripture-like full screen is seen, complete with hands in the prayer position in the center. On the screen reads, quote, what you're fixing to see is a true story. We then see our narrator in a white coat and bow tie standing in front of what appears to be an anatomy lab. He introduces Mr. Bernie Tita, a soft-spoken portly man with a mustache who thanks the professor for inviting him back for this demonstration. As he speaks, the scene zooms out to reveal a cadaver behind him, making clear that this is a mortician's lecture. Mr. Tita then goes into great detail about his meticulous procedure in preparing a body for display. As he finishes his presentation, a lively Western version of I was sinking deep in sin, love lifted me, begins to play as the same full screen returns, this time reading, quote, who is Bernie? Thus begins Richard Linklater's 2011 black comedy, Bernie, and the true story of Bernie Tita and the murder of Marjorie Nugent. This is crime scene. In July of 1997, a local woman in Carthage, Texas noticed the absence of local widow Marjorie Nugent around town. Though standoffish and perceived as cruel, Mrs. Nugent nonetheless was a well-known fixture of the East Texas town and had not been seen in public for some time. The worried local put in a call to the sheriff's office. Once again, due to her reputation and other pressing matters at the time, Mrs. Nugent's whereabouts were put on hold for almost a month. Bernie Tita, Mrs. Nugent's closest friend and business partner, was asked if he knew of her whereabouts while attending a local college student's wedding in Las Vegas. Tita claimed she was staying in a hospital in Temple under a different name because she did not wish to be contacted. But authorities were unable to locate anyone who matched her description in any hospitals in Temple. Rod Nugent Jr., Marjorie's only son, was contacted and arrived in Carthage with his eldest daughter shortly after, ready to file a missing persons report. As they searched her empty estate, the granddaughter noticed that the deep freeze had been taped shut. There, hidden under bags of frozen food, was Marjorie Nugent, wrapped in a white sheet. The entire freezer, body still in case, was relocated to Dallas for evidence examination and an autopsy, a generator connected to it to keep it working. As deputies scrambled to gather more evidence, the biggest question in the investigation remained. Where was Bernie Tita? And was he involved in Mrs. Nugent's death? Bernard Tita Jr. was born on August 2, 1958 in Tyler, Texas to Bernard Sr. and Leela May Jester. His father, a native of Ogilnow, Russia, formerly the Ukraine, immigrated to the United States in 1926 and served as a professor of music and choral director at Our Lady of the Lake College, now a university, in San Antonio from 1946 to 1948. He later served in the same role at Southern Methodist University in Dallas from 1948 to 1957, Kilgore College in Kilgore from 1957 to 1968, and then as the director of the McMurray Channers at McMurray College, now a university, in Abilene from 1968 until his death in either 1973 or 1974. I could not find a confirmed death date, but his death did take place when Bernie was 15. Bernard Sr. was also a church music director and vocal performer throughout his life. Leela was his first wife, whom he married in 1957. She died in a car accident when her only son was three years old. He then remarried Clara Catherine Wiley in 1963. Bernie Jr. took on an after-school part-time job at a local funeral home during his time at Cooper High School in Abilene, with his sister noting, quote, He wasn't a dour boy. He was popular at high school, and for kicks he'd sneak the hearse on Fridays out of the funeral home and drive a bunch of us around Abilene. He graduated from Cooper in 1976 and went on to earn an associate's degree in mortuary science from McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana. 
He later moved to Carthage, where he earned a job at Hawthorne Funeral Home, becoming quite popular in and around town due to his involvement in his church and recreational activities. He also became popular with local elderly widows who he would tend to while performing the funeral services for their late husbands. This is exactly how he came to know Marjorie Nugent. Born in 1915, just outside of Carthage, Marjorie Midyet was the daughter of a grocery store owner. She attended Louisiana Tech, where she met R.L. Rod Nugent, whom I might note shares the same first name as my maternal grandfather, and I never thought I'd hear or meet another person named R.L. in my life. Just saying. Rod had recently graduated from Tech with an electrical engineering degree, and after he and Marjorie married, he took a job with Magnolia Oil, which went on to become the more well-known giant, Mobile. His job saw them live in various areas throughout Louisiana, New Mexico, and Texas, 12 plus years of which were spent in Midland, where they also raised their only child, Rod Jr. For those of you who may not be familiar with Texas, Midland's economy heavily relies on oil and gas, so it makes sense that the Nugent spent a decent amount of time there. Midland's also known for being the hometown of former First Lady Laura Bush, as well as the one-time home of former Presidents George H.W. and George W. Bush, as well as former First Lady Barbara Bush. Do with that information what you will. In 1989, the Nugents returned to Rod Sr.'s home of Carthage, where they built a 6,000-square-foot stone home at the edge of town, surrounded by a stone wall and electronic gates. It was noted that Marjorie was somewhat of a recluse, rarely leaving the house and being not so friendly with local residents. She even refused to speak to one of her sisters that lived in Carthage due to an argument the two had had back in the 80s over their deceased mother's estate. She also rarely spoke to her son due to the number of arguments the two had gotten into over the years. Many considered Marjorie hard to get along with, one local stating that she, quote, acted as if she was too good for Carthage. Another local stated that, quote, if she had had her nose any higher, she would have drowned in a rainstorm. Contrasting that of Bernie Tita, Marjorie did not participate in civic activities or contribute in any way to local causes, suggesting that she may have hated spending money in town. In Skip Hollinsworth's 1998 Texas Monthly article, Midnight in the Garden of East Texas, quote, a local veterinarian claimed that when he informed Marjorie he would need to charge her $45 for treating her dog, she argued with him until he lowered the price. A close relative, purposely unidentified, believes Marjorie at times lapsed into low-level clinical depression, saying, quote, Marjorie was a very difficult woman to love. When Rod Sr. died of unexpected heart failure in 1990, only a handful of people attended his funeral. It was held at Hawthorne Funeral Home, where Bernie Tita worked. Bernie's normal routine of entertaining and catching up with widows did not stop with Marjorie, though I'm sure he was aware of her reputation around town. The two became inseparable, spending every waking moment with each other. Nugent soon began spending lavish amounts of money on Tita, including gifting him with a $12,000 Rolex watch shortly after the funeral of her husband. She also allowed him to begin handling her bills and eventually altered her will to disinherit her son and family and leave her entire $10 million estate to Tita in 1991. He even left his job at Hawthorne in 1993 in order to work full-time as her business manager and travel companion. They went on frequent trips together, traveling to Asia, Egypt, Russia, and even cruising to Europe aboard the Queen Mary. Many town locals suspected seduction and romance were involved in the close relationship of Bernie and Marjorie, though this was more than likely just speculation. In fact, Bernie's former boss at Hawthorne Funeral Home remarked, quote, He showed no romantic interest in women his age at all. I think some of the men during their coffee shop talks would insinuate that Bernie was a little light in the loafers. The more than likely answer was Bernie's own tendency to keep his hand glued to his wallet. Bernie was by all accounts a shopaholic and was sorely tempted by Marjorie's surplus of money. He was constantly behind in his American Express payments and owed $4,000 in back taxes to the IRS. Nevertheless, he bought a two-bedroom home one mile from Nugent's, decorating his front yard with his collection of penguins, of which he had an affinity for because, quote, they looked so well-dressed. He also kept his display of 70-plus wristwatches in the hallway and earned a pilot's license so he could purchase a couple of small airplanes. Unbeknownst to Marjorie, however, Bernie was also handing her money out to pretty much anyone in Carthage that could use it. He bought at least 10 cars for individuals without, and a home for a young couple struggling with finances. He provided scholarships to Panola College students and even pledged $100,000 to his home church of First United Methodists building campaign. 
Though it seems for all his spending, Bernie was paying the true price and quality time spent with Marjorie. She demanded he lay out her medications every day and would throw a fit and call him incessantly if he was not at her house by lunchtime at 1145 every single day. When he was visiting with others, Bernie would have to interrupt conversations at random intervals in order to check on Mrs. Nugent at her request. All of this had to have taken a toll on Bernie and would have surely run anyone else in Carthage off. But not Bernie. He had an obligation. For Thanksgiving in 1996, Bernie traveled alone to see his sister and informed her that Mrs. Nugent had traveled to Ohio to spend the holidays with the sister she was on good terms with. For the next few months, he gave many accounts of Mrs. Nugent's whereabouts, ranging from a hospital in Temple to remaining at home to an intensifying bout of Alzheimer's or even recovering from a stroke. Mrs. Nugent's maid, however, continued to travel to her estate to clean, but the house was always empty when she arrived. Bernie continued to spend money lavishly around town, including funding a local theater's adaptation of The Music Man and helping a group of business owners open up a westernware shop. When her body was discovered by family members and deputies in July of 1997, authorities immediately searched the town for Mrs. Nugent's only friend. Bernie was found preparing to escort a Little League team and their families to lunch and went willingly into questioning. He quickly admitted to the murder, stating that he shot her in the back four times on November 19, 1996, with a 22 caliber rifle that she had bought for him to shoot the armadillos digging up her garden. After the murder, he cleaned the body and placed her in the freezer and gave gifts to several friends, which she had previously given him power of attorney to use her money. Although his confession was made public to the people of Carthage, residents were outraged by the idea that their beloved Bernie was a killer. Marjorie Nugent's first cousin, Ruth Cockrell, put it best, stating, quote, I was worried something had happened to her, but I didn't know who to talk to about it. Bernie was so beloved in Carthage that if I had suggested he had done anything wrong, I would have been laughed out of town. Bernie Tita's arrest caused uproar in the small town. A group of townswomen attempted to raise money for his $1.5 million bond, but the DA filed additional theft charges to raise the bond to $2.7 million. IRS agents additionally charged Tito with money laundering an estimated $1 million from Nugent. To add fuel to Bernie's fire, Sheriff Jack Ellett said certain Carthage men, rumors reaching from elected city officials to authorities, were seen on videotapes confiscated from Bernie's house engaged in what could only be described by the Panola Watchman paper as, quote, misconduct. Obviously, this being a small town in Texas in the late 90s and rumors of Bernie's sexuality still prevalent, it was clear that these videotapes may have contained sexually explicit content. A local man even showed up to a Carthage High School football game following the release of this information, wearing a shirt reading, quote, I'm the only one in Carthage, not on the videotapes. Family and friends of Bernie hired legendary Texas criminal defense attorney Clifton Scrappy Holmes to defend him, but District Attorney Danny Buck Davidson questioned whether a fair trial could be conducted in Carthage due to Bernie's overwhelming popularity. The trial was ultimately moved away from the small town to San Augustine, 47 miles away, and in 1999, a jury sentenced Bernie Tita to life in prison for Marjorie Newton's murder. His supporters shouted out a chorus of, We love you, Bernies, as he was led out of the courtroom. Shortly after his arrival at the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, he was attacked by fellow inmates, but went on to become, as a prison official, described a, quote, model prisoner, teaching health classes and participating in the prison choir. Not long after Bernie's conviction, Texas-based filmmaker Richard Linklater, famous for 1993's Days and Confused and 2003's School of Rock, and Skip Hollinsworth, who documented Bernie's story for Texas Monthly, began developing a screenplay together based on Hollinsworth's original article, Midnight in the Garden of East Texas. After sitting on a shelf for nearly a decade, production started on the film. Principal photography lasted 22 days during September and October of 2010 and took place in parts of Bastrop, Smithville, Georgetown, Lockhart, Carthage, and Austin, Texas. The film, similar to that of The Town That Dreaded Sundown, mixes documentary style with fictional elements, framing the story around interviews with Carthage locals, some of which were actually played by residents of the town. Linklater later stated the screenplay he wrote with Hollinsworth was a boring read and that, quote, the gossip element almost kept the film from being boring. I said, quote, but they'll be funny characters. I could just imagine the accents. Jack Black actually met with Tita at Telford Unit at the Texas Department of Justice to get a better understanding of his character, the interaction being seen during the credits. 
Shirley MacLaine also spoke with Tita over the phone. Richard Linklater even made a cameo appearance as one of the five deadbeat dads during the Hand on a Hard Body competition. It'll make sense if you watch the movie. Bernie had its world premiere on the opening night of the 2011 Los Angeles Film Festival and was further released on April 27, 2012 by Millennium Entertainment. It received very positive reviews upon its release with Mark Savlov of the Austin Chronicle stating, quote, if I hadn't already read Skip Hollinsworth Texas Monthly article recounting the tragic comic tale of Carthage's assistant funeral director Bernie Tita, I'd swear this film adaptation was based on one of Joe R. Lansdale's East Texas Gothics. As ever, truth proves itself stranger than fiction and the human heart, which is stranger and more inscrutable than anything. And Jack Black redeems himself with a subtly quirky performance that's one of his personal best. The redemption referring to that of Gulliver's Travels. I'm not going to offer my opinion. Despite critics absolutely loving Bernie, the town of Carthage was not so pleased. Some citizens hoped it would stimulate tourism in the area, while others were angered by the idea that a comedy film was derived from the murder of an 81-year-old widow. Danny Buck Davidson said the movie does not share Nugent's side of the story, and once again criticizes the making of a black comedy out of a true-to-life murder. Nugent's nephew, Joe Rhodes, however, told New York Times Magazine, and yes, they have a Sunday supplement, Quote, I've now seen the movie Bernie twice, and except for a few insignificant details, it tells the story pretty much the way it ended. Now, I first saw this film about four years ago, and it was available on Netflix after being made aware of it a few years prior. I had seen an advertisement for it in what I believe was People magazine and was instantly enthralled with the idea of a lovely mortician murdering a bitter old woman in a black comedy setting. I don't condone murder, it's just an interesting story. Not to mention Richard Linklater perfectly capturing the many sides of Texas in his previous films, I needed no convincing. The film is beautiful, visually and story-wise, and has perfect comedic timing. Jack Black, Shirley MacLaine, and Matthew McConaughey capture their characters with honesty and assurance that provides an intimate look at misunderstood and overlooked archetypes. While Rotten Tomatoes has it at 88% certified fresh and Metacritic rates it as 75 out of a 100, I give it 8.5 spooks out of 10 for a colorfully framed story that, in my opinion, does its source material justice. In 2014, Danny Buck and visiting judge Diane DeVasto of Tyler allowed Bernie Tita's release from his life sentence on $10,000 bail after the case appeals attorney Jody Cole discovered Tita had been sexually abused for multiple years as a child. Tita had previously requested this appeal and fired a post-conviction writ of habeas corpus in which he alleged his constitutional rights had been violated in the first trial because of new evidence that had been discovered. He also claimed the abusive behavior Nugent had subjected him to drove him to kill her in a dissociative state brought on by years of sexual abuse he had endured. Cole and forensic psychiatrist Richard Pesikoff further backed his claim, stating, quote, Mr. Tita's ability to repress and compartmentalize the abusive events from childhood and adolescence was ultimately overwhelmed by the repeated and extensive psychological abuse he suffered from Mrs. Nugent. The end result, his loss of control over his emotions and behavior, is evidenced in his final actions towards Mrs. Nugent. Along with the suggestion of the threat of Tita's private videotapes being released, Davidson stated that if he had been aware of this new information, he would have sought a lighter sentence in the first trial. Nugent's granddaughter, however, was outraged by the granted release and suggested Linklater's film had influenced the legal system. Funny enough, between his 2014 release and his resentencing in April 2016, Bernie lived with Linklater in his garage apartment as a condition of his release. At the beginning of his new trial, Shanna Nugent, Marjorie's granddaughter, spoke directly to Tita, stating, quote, You are nothing to me. She and Rod both asserted that Marjorie had in fact been a kind lady on good terms with her family and was nothing like Shirley MacLaine's portrayal in the film. They also claimed that Tita had conned Nugent into spending her fortune without her knowledge, suggesting elder abuse. However, Gregg County Commissioner Daryl Primo testified that in a conversation with Nugent between 1991 and 1996, she had spoken well of Tita, claiming, quote, I'll spend every dime of my money before I leave it to my family. Additionally, Nugent's sister, Meryl Rhodes, stated that she had always been afraid of Marjorie and that while she loved her, she did many ugly things. On top of that, Meryl's son, Joe, attested to the film's portrayal and noted several instances of his aunt's abuse towards him in a New York Times article titled, How My Aunt Marge Ended Up in a Deep Freeze. 
On April 22, 2016, after three weeks of testimony and a four-hour deliberation, a jury of 10 women and two men issued a new sentence of 99 years or life for Tita. One week after his resentencing, Tita's lawyers filed an appeal to the court's decision, but it was upheld in August of 2017. As of April 2020, Bernie Tita is being held at the Connolly Unit of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice in Kennedy, Texas. As noted in the film that was shot before his second trial, Bernie spent his free time making needlework memorials for Carthage's recently deceased. I'm unaware, however, of whether or not he still continues this practice. He is eligible for parole in 2029. Marjorie Nugent is buried in a small rural cemetery outside of Carthage next to her husband. After Tita's 2014 release, Nugent's granddaughter created a website to honor her memory, posting photos and articles related to her murder. You can find it at MarjorieNugent.com. Skip Hollinsworth, who has followed Bernie's story since the beginning, has written four follow-up articles for Texas Monthly concerning Bernie. Lights Camera Carthage in May 2012 about the making of the film. Bernie Returns in January 2014 about the possibility of Tita's release. Bernie has been released from prison, notably located in the Can't Make This Up section of the Texas Monthly website, about his plans to live in Richard Linklater's garage apartment. And most recently, Bernie in Hell in June 2016, reflecting on his own near 20-year relationship with Tita's case after the con man was sent back to prison. I just now got the pun of Bernie in Hell. Wow, Alyssa. Good job. Skip Hollinsworth continues to write for Texas Monthly as of May 2020. Thank you so much for listening to Crime Scene A. All of the information you've heard in this episode comes from articles written by Skip Hollinsworth for Texas Monthly, Wikipedia, Richard Linklater's Bernie, and of course, IMDb. I apologize for doing two Texas stories in a row. I'm just a very big fan of Hollinsworth and Linklater and wanted an excuse for them to possibly hire me in the future. Also, I live in Texas, so there's that. The music you've heard throughout the episode is by my friend Colby. I'll include his SoundCloud in the description. And I'd like to dedicate this episode to Marjorie Nugent and her family, as well as the town of Carthage, who forever have to live with the memory of Bernie Tita. We can't change history, but we can educate for the future. I'm Alyssa Chester, and please be kind and stay enlightened. Mm -hmm.